Uh, I would like to welcome today Dr. Connor Brady. For those of you who are not familiar with him, he's from Ireland, so we're going to get to hear a cool accent. And uh, he wrote a book that actually came out in the end of 2020. Yep, December 20. Okay, it's called Feeding Dogs, The Science Behind the Dry Versus Raw Debate. And this is not just a, a, hey, you know, dry food stinks and raw food is good and everybody should do that. It's got 500 pages of well-researched science and uh, talks about the myth <laughs> that some of the things that we are told and the advertising. And um, so first of all, Connor, thank you so much for agreeing to come talk to us today. Thanks for having me on, Judy. It's a, it's a pleasure and a privilege. So um, I we always kind of start these things when we're interviewing people uh, that have, you know, come up through the ranks and become very popular and well known. And, um, you know, you have just so much knowledge in your head. How did you get started in this? What drove you to say, I'm going to spend my life researching pet food? Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, it wasn't really by choice. I think it's probably the same as the rest of us. We were we were led by the nose. I was in guide dogs. I came out of college after years studying uh, nutrition behavior, specifically the effect of nutrition on, on behavior. In I used deer as my test subject. I didn't study dogs. I studied deer, group living animals, essentially. It was a very interesting, I liked it. And uh, I, I came out after that project and uh, I joined Irish guide dogs as a pup supervisor and eventually a trainer. And then a role came up in Australia and I just thought, okay, I'd like to, I prefer to do this in the sunshine rather than the flashing <laughs> rain at home, which is the same line I use all the time, but it's true. You know, if you want to train dogs, you want to do it outside. Yeah. So um, <laughs> we went to Australia and uh, it was while I was over there that you, you bump into the raw feeding wall quite at the time, Australia was streets ahead. Now I believe it's, it's Britain that are miles ahead, but at the time, Australia, because uh, Dr. Billionhurst and Lonsdale were the two prominent vets over there, the two raw fathers pushing the message. So uh, Australia were way ahead and I bumped into that and I, would, I was already doing a bit of raw feeding and I ran a little experiment on I had about 18 dogs in my care and four or five of them were on, on non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. As if that alone was just normal, five of 18 dogs on non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. It's so casually accepted. So I just exactly. thought, maybe we could do better here. Took a bit of advice off Ian, put the dogs onto this raw diet and, uh, you know, they turn inside out. And it's like, wow, look at the difference. And I rush back to the vets thinking, check out my little experiment. And they didn't quite join me uh, in, the, in the little happy jig I was doing in the hall. So I was, a bit, I was a bit put out by that. But it was when I met this unbelievable CEO, Chris Lane, her name was, uh, is. And uh, she was the CEO of uh, Brisbane Guide Dogs. Uh, called guide dogs queensland and she was unbelievable because they had a training population of about 200 220 dogs on the street and in training about the same size as irish guide dogs and chris had saw what was going on with raw feeding and she said i'm going to give it a go myself so she did a little experiment on a few dogs saw the difference and then changed 220 dogs from dry food to raw food and i'm, I'm wow. talking to chris going how are you getting on and she goes well we're two years into it and veterinary bills have fallen by 80 percent." and i'm like whoa 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 stop say that again and she says oh yeah check out my my new piece in the in the courier times of brisbane there uh, leading national paper and i'm reading this and the 80 percent for the top things like recurring skin and ear and good issues uh, orthopedic surgery and consult the top things for guide dogs most dogs but guide right. dogs particularly he said the dog's just unbelievable kennels are quiet they 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 drink less water they're eating less salt so there's less training accidents so they're easier to train the, the kennels don't smell the dogs are better able for their training these are all throwaway comments and she has serious staff behind her lauren elgi is a massive breed manager she had working for her she's the biggest in the southern hemisphere and what she doesn't know about breeding dogs i mean she was the queen uh, of, of that end of things same thing she just said look uh, it's a pity that we have to uh, ever have these dogs back on dry food big raw feeders anyway is the point so i take this amazing story and i go wow look what this guy dog organization is doing not only have they kind of uh, saved a lot on vet bills but actually they branded their own raw dog food and so suddenly they were feeding their dogs for free and she just a for unbelievable business mind so i thought she can help so many people she's just turned her charity into this unbelievable machine and i ran back to my superiors and said look what we can do we can not only can we slash our vet bills the biggest cost any training organization has but we can actually just like 
have this food in and i was I, i'm i'm just dreaming these ideas and they just said well yeah no not really and i just couldn't believe that answer and i just i just said what is the problem i gave them a three hour uh kind of a science um uh, like a like a seminar for want of a better word that was the start of my raw feeding seminar that's what put me on the circuit and they all said that was very interesting and then that was it they'd no interest <laughs> right. that, that was for me was just, we're not going to do that <laughs> no and so i was just like okay well it's me or the dry food and they said well the dry food and i'm like oh no oh sorry oh, my- <laughs> now i'm out of work <laughs> yeah. So I had to run out to the car park, floods of tears, not really. But I ring my wife and say, I'm after quitting my job here. And uh, so the next thing for me was to go back into research. I'm good at research. This is what I'm trained on. I'm trained to uh, look at a question and you look at it from all different sides and try to find the answer. That's what a, a doctorate trains you to do. I didn't really realize what the training was about when I was doing it. But now I realize I'm good at finding solutions. So 10 years later, I had the book and there now. <laughs> I proved them wrong, but they don't read it. So they don't read it. it. No. Well, you know, it's it's interesting because when I was I, I retired from clinical practice about a year and a half ago, but when I was in practice in New Jersey, the biggest uh, seeing eye guide dog school is in New Jersey to train the dogs at right. seeing eye, and of course they're heavily funded by big pet food and mm. prescription diets. And so I would get a lot of clients the, the the local 4-H kids had a seeing eye group where they basically raised the puppies for the first year. So they'd have to do learn to do basic obedience and how to take care of the dog and, you know, kind of train them, get them out and about and used to being around people. And these dogs would come in because, of course, they're told what they have to feed. And these dogs would come in with these horrendous chronic ear infections and horrendous yeah. skin infections and just, I mean, just a nightmare yeah. um, and so i would say well we've got to get them off this food we've got to get off this kibble we've got to you know and, and i would give them many options and i said look i don't think they're going to go for raw but that's what i'd really like and if they won't do that can we at least give real food and let's yeah, put anything else. yeah. no absolutely yeah. not allowed and yeah. Yeah. Um, i had one client who had a guide dog a labrador that he had gotten through the group because he was blind so it was his working dog. When he got the dog, it weighed 65 pounds. He fed what they were telling him to feed. The dog blew up to 130 pounds. Yeah, wow. At 130 pounds, the dog could not fit in its seeing eye harness. Therefore, it could not work. And they would not, again, allow us to change the diet on that dog other than to go to a prescription weight loss diet, which the dog oh. didn't lose an ounce. Then they put the dog on a medication to try to help it lose weight. It gave it diarrhea, but it didn't help it lose weight. So after playing around with that for almost a year, and the poor man still hasn't been able to use his dog for that year, I finally took the dog home to my house and I said, I'm going to get the weight off this dog. I put the dog on a raw food diet and the the weight just started shedding off that dog. So (laughs) when I gave him back the dog, I said, just don't tell them what you're feeding. (laughs) How many people say that? Just don't say anything. Like do it in the background, which is... We're seeing that in, in every respect. That's how people are dealing with their vets today. They're not telling them the truth of what's going on, which is even more dangerous. You want your, your vet should be, it's to, totally like a, a give and take relationship. You want them on side, but they're saying, well, I just won't tell them about the feeding. And I was like, well, that's quite a large thing you're not telling your doctor about, you know, it's, uh, yeah. so that's it. That's a, and isn't it a pity you, you, you alluded to something there. Uh, Chris, uh, Chris Lane uh, was running this incredible program, turned the, the organization inside out amazing should should have been on the front of time magazine for what she could do for people all around the world not just in brisbane this could be replicated in any guide dog school sure, sure. like and it's not just visually impaired people the, the, these organizations work with uh, kids with autism now and all sorts of things you know so all these training groups could have benefited in 2015 on january 1st chris lane was fired and i got onto chris lane and i said what's going on chris and uh, so she gave me back me gave it back to me in an email and i don't want to quarter of her about him because i don't have it in front of me but essentially she was let go because she wouldn't sign the mars dry food contract i don't use brand names very easily believe me uh, that book had to go through a couple of barristers before i released it but uh, that's what happened all the other organizations are sponsored by mars and in chris's words she believes that uh, it was because she wouldn't sign the mars contract they fired chris and the very next day they brought back in mars dry food so for me, that is a massive problem because if the veterinary bills fell, 
when the dogs when the dogs were changed to real food. I can only expect that the veterinary bills went the other way. I tried to find the truth of that because it's a government funded organization. I couldn't get the details I needed before the book came out. So I just found that very, very sad. And I just thought, my God, the power that can that somebody uh, wields over us. It's like you can get rid of the, the most impressive person that's ever run a training school that could change the lives of thousands of people. And we'll get rid of her because she's not really telling the right line. And you fall in line with the other guide dog schools for the sake of a few crumbs each year. I mean, I know the figures because I was in guide dogs. I know the small checks that it takes to, to, to be in with these companies. It is value for money for these companies. But uh, oh, yeah. no, I don't say the dark side too much, but that, that was the start of me. And I just said, that is so wrong. Um, so really, that was the start of my 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 long days back at back at research. Yeah. So one of the things in reading about your book, um, one of the things that was I, I, maybe it's in the description that you wrote about the book, but talking about the, the basically the false advertising, the false promises. Talk about that a little bit, because I, I, I really feel like this is the problem. Like people, it's sort of like if you only watch one news channel, you only get things from one perspective. Yeah. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of people become very close minded um, because they believe what is put in front of them. So let's let's talk about some of the yeah. things that are being put in front of people that are absolutely false yeah um i think uh i think that we have these incredible vets vets have to work their asses off to get into college and then in college work their asses off to to, to just to get out of it and then catapult it into this business and it's like right now you've got staff and heating and bills as well as every animal on the planet and every ailment and every single bit of science that could be around them and stay on top of every bit of literature and all it is an impossible ask for vets so um i would say that we have a bit of a problem with the, the veterinary industry in that they are very much a science-based organization and evidence-based. But the problem is that when you look at the evidence for, let's say, just uh, kibble or cereal-based dry food, because there's better kibbles out there, we just don't get to talk about it. But at uh, cereal-based pet food, the, in my opinion, kind of the lowest of the low, the wheat or corn-based muck that's been fed for the last mm -hmm. 70 years, since the end of the Second World War, and they haven't changed it, not a bit. So um, I would say that... Our problem is there and the what people say is kind of like and I don't want to get too political about things that just happened. But, you know, you've got to trust the science these days. Don't look at it. Don't ask to see it. But there's a lot of trust in science. And I think that vets believe that they are backed by a lot of science. There's huge books there, the small animal clinical nutrition, you know, it's 1500 page monster of a book. And there's, you know, some of them will hold it up to you and say, have you read this? And I'll go, well, I have. But have you read the section on protein or carbohydrates? It's, it's so flimsy. Uh, and in fact, the science that they do have, they're called unfalsifiable comparisons. So while they believe that all those, these lots of these studies here in support, it's like, have you read those studies? Because if you take a, a you, you, you touched on one of the products there, like a, a magic weight loss pet food, you know, where they, instead of actually dropping the carbohydrate content of the food, which we all know will be the thing to do, of course, we've got all the studies we need to show higher protein diet, better weight loss results in dogs, better retention of lean muscle mass. So the weight loss lasts longer, all that. We know all this from yeah. human studies we have dog studies we don't need any more studies but they have a single study of a magic dry food that if you put in 10 percent indigestible plant filler into this food and you lock the dogs in cages then these dogs that are eating indigestible fiber will lose ever so much a tiny bit of extra weight compared to the dogs eating regular standard kibble so this has hailed the success so the thing is they have scientifically proven that this product works to reduce weight loss it's just not real it's just not of any value because this isn't how animals live you know a labrador is going to climb the walls looking for food if you try and diet them like a runway model three days before a show eating paper tissue you know so we know that's a desperate way but there's even more insidious like the there's a there's a dermal care product and the the, the study is woeful there's two groups of 20 dogs one eating standard cereal-based milk and then the other cereal-based muck, but with a cod liver oil tablet in it, essentially. That's the, and they found that after maybe three weeks, uh, group B that were getting a little bit of extra omega-3s in their diet had less pruritus or whatever they were measuring. And this is now wrapped up as clinically proven to be good for dog skin. They just took something from nutrition. We know fish oil reduces steroid need in dogs. We know it reduces itch. We know it does all these things. 
but it's like kind of like bringing out um, M&Ms or well, I shouldn't be saying any product names, but like a candy with fish oil in it. Now your kids can eat it and they'll be slightly less itchy. Well, it's like, is that a reason to eat that candy? Well, not really, but just, you know, it's, it's, it's complicated. Yeah, and, um, I just, there's a, there's a new, um, I think it's called, it, I think it's a new heart diet that somebody nice. asked me about. And it's the same thing. They put a little bit of omega-3 in there and I'm like, yeah. And yeah. a little extra taurine and carnitine. I'm like, yeah. or we could feed meat. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. So like we have these, we have this desperate situation where uh, unfortunately our hard overworked vets have, have jumped to this situation in the belief that they're surrounded by science. And then once they're there, because they look, took that leap in dogma, not by reading any actual science that I've read, but there is no head to head studies, not a single head to head study favors the use of cereal based pet food over real food. They've never read that study. So Unfortunately, the position now is when they're in this strange position, they say, you now have to prove using science that we're wrong. And I was like, hang on there a second. You're the guys with the product. It's up to you to prove your product is safe and nutritious and good for long life. So you have to prove it to me. But I'm now in a field where I have to prove the original way of doing things, the normal way of doing things, normal, real food that we know is important for every animal in the zoo, farm, every kid in your house. But I have to prove to you via studies. And so the studies are now slowly coming in. And every single time a head to head study is done raw when it's done correctly, comes out on top. There isn't an, an example of the other way around. These studies aren't big because it costs a lot of money. And the only people with real money are the multinationals that don't want the answer. So our studies are small and like, you know, Helsinki University, uh, Dr. Oh, Professor that was great. Brian Borland, really? Yeah. So she's just coming up with the goods, but they're like, oh, if we just had 20,000 euro, we could do another study. And I'm like, 20,000 euro, that's all you need. I thought it was millions. They can churn these things out. So we are, we are getting there on the science front, but it's a, I, I just don't enter that conversation anymore. Now, if people say, you know, you, you need to come up with a science, like, oh, please, you know, it's, 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 the science hasn't been done on the other side. There isn't any evidence for this particular product. We know the dogs can, can live on it. They can survive but we don't have any studies of dogs thriving or what the difference is. We've got incidences of, of now we see in Europe and in America, longevity in dogs is actually decreasing slightly. Oh, yeah. So, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, so things are not going well. We've got obesity up through the yin yang, pancreatitis is exploding. We've got every single chronic disease is on the right. Cancer 10 times more likely in dogs than is in humans. And we're the most cancer stricken animals after that. So we have big problems. And uh I think we can start by making some very simple changes. I mean, so, some of the easiest changes in nutrition. So why wouldn't you start there? What's the problem, you know? So uh, you, you just mentioned pancreatitis and I get this all the time and I see it on social media all the time and it makes me crazy. So oh, my dog's been on this low fat prescription diet kibble for two years because he had about a pancreatitis and he keeps having flares of pancreatitis and I'm not feeding him anything else. Yeah. So let's hear your explanation. I have mine, but I, you know, yeah. they need to hear it from somebody other than me. <laughs> yeah. Well, pancreatitis, pancreatitis is a hot topic. That and kidney disease, when it comes yep. to the raw debate, we have good evidence. We know what we're talking about. We've got the, st the studies to back us up with pancreatitis. We've known, well, let's start with obesity. In the 70s, people started getting a bit bigger. And we thought, what's going on? Uh, people are getting a bit fat here. And we thought it must be because they're eating fat. So they dropped the fat content of the food and spiked the sugar content of the food. And what do we get for an obesity crisis? It was carbs. It was never fat in the first place. Fat doesn't really make you fat in the same way as carbs do. Carbs and particularly insulin. Insulin makes you fat. So that was the problem with obesity. And the same thing happened with pancreatitis. What happened was that dogs were presenting on the lab to vets and uh, with pancreatitis and acute bout of pancreatitis, which apparently is like a gunshot. It's supposed to be agonizing, not just sore, but proper pain. Right. And uh, the vet will have a look at the bloods and they see that blood fat was high. And they went, oh my God, blood fat is high. You must have been feeding fat to your dog. And you'll go, oh, well, he had a bit of sausage before he killed over. <laughs> and, and you get the blame. But the problem is we've known uh, for 30, 40 years in humans and for the last six years in dogs, Dr. Mark Roberts has been doing the studies. We know that it's not feed, the feeding of fat that spikes blood fat in dogs. It's the feeding of carbohydrates. And in short, painfully simple way of thinking about it is that if you feed a dog lots of carbohydrates every day, the body says, happy enough, I'll burn carbohydrates. That's like the, the gas. That's the really fast energy it's, as opposed to dirty crude oil. It's like, oh, yes, I'll burn carbs. And it stops burning fat. So fat, rather paradoxically, builds in the blood. The more carbs you feed, the more fat builds in the blood. So we know it's the high carbohydrate diets that we're feeding to dogs that are spiking blood triglycerides. 
And then you come along and you give your dog a bit of fat or a sausage. And yes, there's a tiny momentary blip when you feed a high fat diet to a dog, but only short, very short lived. And that can end up with your dog having this spout. But the question should have been, why could your dog not handle a sausage or a bit of fat? These are protein and fat eating machines. This is all they eat. They don't like they are well able for fat and sled dogs and the likes eat very high fat diets when they're working. So we know that the problem is high carbohydrate diets. We know that there is no real pancreatitis solution. If you're in the middle of a bout of pancreatitis, okay, you wouldn't feed high fat diets. You'd feed a very, very lean diet, whatever gets you through. But chronic pancreatitis, there isn't a diet that we can recommend bar cutting carbohydrates completely out of the diet. And my biggest problem is that we've known this for six years. We know carbohydrates are the problem. We know we must remove them from the diet, particularly in chronic pancreatitis dogs. Two thirds of cats and dogs by mid age have some form of pancreatitis. Like it's normal. Mother nature just made a crappy pancreas in this animal. And yet vets haven't, they haven't leapt to this. Like this should, that study by Pangocytos, I think his name is uh, in 2016, that should be held up and and, and passed around the veterinary industries like a, like when a pilot makes a mistake and all the pilots in the world know within 24 hours why isn't that the case you know how are we still doing it so wrong so that's my explanation it gets me very animated judy because that's a big one that we know the solution to it's it's not up for debate you know well yeah, what was it, your thought what was your thought well and interestingly the the prescription diet that they're given is high carbohydrate. I mean, yeah, it's, so, so it's like, here, I'm going to give you something that's going to keep your animal sick. It's going to keep you bringing your animal into my yeah. hospital. Yeah. And it's going to keep you frustrated. And it's going yeah. to keep your your animal in, you know, a, a bad state of affairs. So eventually, the pancreas just poops out anyway. And now we've got yeah. a diabetic animal we have to deal with. It's just, it's mind boggling. You know, it's sort of like if I took my kids to the doctor's office, and they said, here, I want you to feed them these, you know, I, I just want them to eat potato chips and candy and, you know, junk food all day long. Oh, your kid's immune system is going to stink. Your, you know, your kid's health is going to stink. Your kid's going to be obese. Your kid's going to have all these issues. Great. I stay in business and I keep making money and I keep the pharmaceutical yeah. business happy. And, you know, it, it's we wouldn't accept that in yeah. human medicine, although, you know, we, I, we have to, I have to fault yeah. human doctors as, uh, you know, medical doctors yeah. as well, because yeah. I mean, my father struggled with obesity his entire life and he ate a lot. Well, he ate out a lot because he was he traveled a lot and he had all these business dinners. So, he you know, love desserts, love candies. If he wanted a snack, you know, a bag of cookies, no problem. Yeah. And, you know, he was a heavy smoker at one time and not once did his doctors ever say, hey, you should lose weight, change your diet, stop smoking. It was just, here's yeah. another pill. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, it, it's it's rampant in in kind of everything. We're, we're unfortunately supporting the pharmaceutical industries. And, and interestingly, when I left clinical practice, I thought, oh my gosh, I've got all these animals. I've got a bunch of cats. I've got a bunch of dogs. I have to go find a veterinarian <laughs> because yeah. I don't have a license in the state that I live in now. So I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to go find a veterinarian. Well, I've yeah. been here a year and a half and I did find a veterinarian because I wanted to get blood work done on my dogs. And I actually took her the blood samples. <laughs> I took yeah, the dogs, yeah. I took the samples. Yeah, <laughs> I spun them down in my centrifuge. I'm like, here, I'm making this really easy. Here's all the samples yeah. sent out for me. Yeah. But the interesting thing is my dogs are raw fed. My cats are raw fed. I don't have a bunch of sick animals. So, I mean, I have dogs with heart disease, which is genetic. So I might mm. need help with that at some point, but when you have really healthy animals, yes, we still should get a physical exam. We still should get lab work done, yeah. but we're not running in there every month with anal gland problems, infected yeah. ears, itchy skin, you know, draining tracks yeah. from their paws. Uh, it's, it's such a huge difference. Um, so how do you um, couch the argument with the naysayers who are like, oh my gosh, you're, your family is going to die from salmonella and E. coli because you're feeding your dogs raw meat. Yeah, yeah. like, look, that's, uh, you know, it wouldn't it be nice that we could sit down and have like 
if, if and I'm mean when I'm talking to a naysayer, it'd be lovely if we could sit down and have a nutritional debate and say, okay, let's talk about the nutritional qualities of your food, but you don't get to talk about that. We don't get to talk about the advantages of fresh fats over stale fat or maybe right, taking right. out the chemicals or chemical preservatives. I mean, it stops life growing in the food. What effect is having the good for? We know it's not good. Uh, good quality protein. All these things, quite obvious nutritional concepts that I'd love to debate about, but they don't want to debate about that. They want to talk about the scary things. It's like, well, what if you get it wrong and the dog's butt falls off? And it's like, oh, please. You know, so <laughs> we, we know that we can feed. The, like, I, I walked out of the hospital with two kids. Nobody told me exactly what I had to feed that baby. You know, I look back over her last week's food and go, has she eaten anything green this week? And it's like, no. So this is the war I'm having with her at the moment. Well, Holly, four-year-old, won't eat green things. Okay. But yet, but yet she's doing fine. You know? So we, we can handle the dogs the same way. It's just a slightly meatier food pyramid. So that's the kind of, the, the balance kind of thing is, is another topic. But getting on to the next fear thing at the moment, I believe a huge campaign is on like salmonella, E. coli, food poisoning. And I'd say, look, we have a major problem with food po poisoning, particularly in the US. One out of seven Americans are going to get poisoned every year by their food. So we've got massive, we've got, yeah, huge, huge salmonella poisons. But like you've got a meat sector that they permit salmonella in the, in the actual meat, whereas in the dog food, the raw dog food, you're not allowed of any salmonella. How do you make raw dog food in the US if the ingredients have salmonella on them? How do you make that zero? So you've got a big problem over there. We've that's we've we've our own issues over here, believe me, but not with the salmonella one as much, although we do have the problem. So the question is, uh, people will say well, you might poison humans. OK, I, we might. First of all, raw dog food is made on human grade meat. OK, so it, it's it's not made on some spurious. We found a cow at the side of the road and we're going to spew it up. <laughs> We have we, we are just not allowed to do that. It has to be human grade meat. So it has to be the same meat you're eating yourself goes into raw dog food. They don't add any weird things to it. So we know that the figures are, that uh, are not backing it up. We have a massive safety study out of Helsinki, 16,000 responses. And this is a, over a lifetime. So if somebody says, I didn't see any food poisoning from my dog, this is over their entire history of feeding raw. So it ended up being millions of pet food meals. They didn't find, they found, I think, one or two cases, which over millions of meals, and then we'll, and we'll find more than that handling kibble. <laughs> bloody right. Or leafy greens or your fruit and veg. One in seven Americans are getting food poisoned. Don't forget, it's just not by pet food. So we don't talk about that. That doesn't suit the narrative. Uh, and then N Nikki Desicrantis over in, in uh, New Jersey. She's just finished a study, 5,700 people. And uh, same thing, incredibly safe. They found one or two possible links, not one single lab confirmed link. So we know it seems to be incredibly safe. It's not to be complacent. It's just that raw feeders are switched on. They understand this is raw meat. We handle it carefully. It lives in a box in the bottom shelf of the fridge, all the rest. We know that. But the question is, they've never, ever turned that in incredible focus and care for you know you might poison your children they've never looked at dry food because dry food from 2006 to 2016 lay 132 humans out half of them toddlers under two years of age four different studies four different times this happened uh, in that time raw dog food hurt zero people 132 people from kibble based pet food so what's the message and also the FDA found when they looked at the amount of salmonella in raw and dry food, they found that dry food is 70 times more likely to be pulled for salmonella, uh, um, constant, um, salmonella contamination than raw dog food uh, by weight, by volume. So this is from Susan Tixton, Truth About Pet Food. Yep. So yep. we know that dry pet food isn't off the hook. It's not like you've got this completely safe product that doesn't have any issues. It's got aflatoxin problems. It's got storage mites. It's, oh, bloody DCM can kill tens of thousands. The melamine scandal in 2006. Oh, there's another few 10,000 dogs dead. Raw food is killing nobody, no pets. <laughs> and so we have this product that has massive problems here. And they go, raw dog food might be a problem, but it's not. But it might be, but it's not. So you get into this ridiculous debate with them about like what they perceive might be dangerous and we'd say look guys everything's dangerous fresh food necessitates some care and fresh uh, the top one two and three causes of listeria e coli and salmonella in the human pet chain are leafy greens and fruit and veg because they're contaminated with the stuff or, or poor hygiene and so is that a reason not to eat fresh food and veg <laughs> no you know but like, these are all obvious answers to these people but it's just like they have to use fear because they're so entrenched in dogma, they can't actually sit down and have an intelligent debate and say, well, what study did you read that convinced you this is a good idea? Oh, fear, and that might die. And because it's hard, it's caught the cognitive dissonance, it's hard to turn around and go, well, you know, ooh, it seems to have made a mistake here because there isn't actually a single study. That's hard for people to do. Uh, and it's I don't blame the individual vets. I, I they are the best, hardest working. 
you know, honorable, fantastic profession. It's the bloody industry that is in cahoots with the big money. That's the problem. And they bloody know it. And they're producing these vets. And Mars owns, has 50,000 vets on the payroll today in the US. 50,000 yep. vets. Yep. I mean, could you imagine? It's a it's- large portion of the veterinarians in this yeah. country. Could and, you-, you know, unfortunately, they also own our diagnostic labs. They yeah. own our imaging systems. They, own, yeah, I mean, they own the emergency clinics. They own the specialty clinics. Anfield, they- Antec, they own all those big groups in the US. Yeah. So, mm. it, you know, and it's it, like, <laughs> would you, again, would you go to your doctor knowing that they they get paid by the food company and you know it's like here i want you to only eat this because that's my boss yeah. you know yeah. and I, I i i want you to use these medications because that's my boss yeah uh, it, it's a it, it's not a good scenario and no. I, I and by uh by the year 2030, we are supposed to have a 30% veterinary shortage in this country. What? And unfortunately, yeah, we're, I mean, huge problem. Why? What's the, what's the, what's the problem with retention? What's the... There's a, well, first of all, uh, COVID, COVID was wonderful for the veterinary profession. Everybody got really fried and uh, all the baby boomers, my generation, most of them quit. <laughs> most of them said, now's a good time to retire. I'm out. Uh, so we lost a a huge um, a huge patch of people. Okay. Uh, the younger ones that are coming out have uh, a different focus on work than what we did as baby boomers. That my generation, like putting in eighty and hundred hours a week, never. I mean, that was just what we thought was expected of us. Yeah. Now and and. Let me tell you, they they are more focused on quality of life for themselves, which is probably a good thing because yeah. the suicide rate is so high in the veterinary yeah. profession. Shocking. So it's a good thing because my kids grew up in my clinic. All my friends' kids grew up in their clinic. And you know, your 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 infants ha- just had the third cage from the right. You know, it's just yeah. that's just what we did. And then my kids yeah. learned how to work in the clinic because that's you know that's where I was. That's where they were. Yeah. Um, so we've got this new generation over the past maybe 10 years that they don't want to work all those hours. They want to work 30 to 35 hours a week. If you really push them, you might get 40. So it takes oh. two of them to do the hours that one of us would do. So nice. that's part of it. And nobody looks at that, that part of the profession. We don't have that many veterinary schools. There's some new ones coming, but they're very expensive. They're hard to get on, on yeah, board. Yeah. Um, and they can't generate 500 students in a class. I mean, you, you get more than about 120 and it gets very difficult to manage that number of people with the learning okay. that you've done. So, um, and with COVID and everybody staying home, a lot more people adopted animals. So there's a bigger yeah. pet population within homes, bigger, um, you know, population yeah. of pet yeah. owners seeking veterinary care. And, and it, it actually is at a crisis level already here in that when people have an emergency, they can't even get into an emergency clinic. They're like, yeah, I don't have a doctor that, available to look at your pet. You know, I, I've i oh, got, that's scary. I've that's got scary. 50 in front of you in line. And I called the vet school here in North Carolina the other day to get an echocardiogram on my 14 year old dog. The first available appointment is in October. Wow. <laughs> no way. But I'm Judy Morgan. <laughs> I <know. laughs> well, you know, if they if they actually knew who I was, they'd probably say, yeah, and yours is October of 2025. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Bloody hell, that's not good. That sounds a little bit scary. That that's it is. Uh, so yeah. I I think that makes it even more critical. And this is why uh we've basically uh turned our business around naturally healthy pets is becoming an educational platform yeah. where we, you know, we talk to people like you who can give us the science behind what we need to be feeding our dogs and why. Um, and this goes for cats too. So sorry, kitty cat people we're always saying dogs, but um, oh. it, it's, it's for both. Yeah. Um, but I think it's even more critical that people learn how to feed their pets correctly to stop putting chemicals in their body, you know, whether yeah. that's flea tick, heartworm, vaccine, preservatives, yeah. whatever. We need to keep them healthier so that we're not standing 
here at three o'clock in the morning with a dog with blood coming out both ends of its body and nobody available to see it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's that's a that's a good point, isn't it? Like you know, we talk. There was a there's a great group of vets in the in the UK called Wiley Vets, and uh, uh, Brendan and uh, Morkel were the uh, not Brendan. Um, oh, his name Richard. Richard and Morkel sounds like a TV show. Uh, were the were the head directors of that business? But what they did was they said, look, guys, uh, they instead of you spending money on pet insurance, which I think only less than 1% of American pet uh, parents have uh, pet insurance at the moment, that's getting too expensive as well, which is scary mm-hmm. when you consider how hard it is to get in. Anyway, big problems there. So what they, what these guys in the UK said was, instead of spending your money on uh, on pet insurance, you can give us the pet insurance. They're quite a large veterinary group. They had about 20 vets working for them, all raw promoting. You can't promote dry food in their clinic. So huge, big, big group, yeah. And they said, when they when you started paying them, let's say you go in with a Labrador and you pay them 100 quid a month or whatever the bill is, um, they flipped the veterinary approach on its head. And they said, right, now that you're paying us to keep your dog healthy, we're going to make some requests of you because we make more money the less we see your dog, if you understand. you know. So they don't want to see your dog every day. They don't want your dog to be sick. They make more money if he's healthy. So what do they do? They ban dry food, no more flea treatments, uh, monthly flea treatments, no more annual boosters. All the stuff that we talk about to, to preserve health that we, in the dark side, us, us kind of, you know, natural type operating at a gloomy tense in carnivals. Uh, <laughs> suddenly this veterinary group said, well, actually, we want you to be healthy. So if you've been feeding dry food for more than a year, you can't go on our plan. You're not allowed to use these fleet and warmest boosters. Uh, suddenly lactose process kennel cough is a discussion as opposed to just stick it in the dog. Why not? It's totally safe. So I take great solace from that because when it's done as a business model, you can see that all the things we're promoting us in the little dark side. It's, it's bloody true. People forget that, like, it's like in this town that I'm living in at the moment, just south of Dublin, we've got like, you know, 10, 15 pharmacies. We've got one natural health shop, a health shop, we call them. A health shop is anything that sells herbs, vitamins, minerals, organic food. You know, that's a health shop. And you've got pharmacies. Pharmacies are for when you get sick. So you've got this as this Richard, one of the directors of Wiley Vets, who I just mentioned, as Richard was explaining to me, he goes, he's obsessed with this idea of wellness. And he said, like, if you have a scale of naught to 100, where the first 80 points, you're healthy and happy and everything's going great. And as you get close to, you know, go past 70, you're starting to creak a bit. And at 80, a few warning shots are coming off. I'm a bit ill. And then after 80, some catastrophic illness starts coming in. 90, you're in big trouble. And 100, you're dead. And he said, the point, the point is, on this scale of not to 80, not to 90, you didn't give a damn. You didn't give your body all the things it needed. You just took it for granted. We just wait until we get sick. And when we get sick, haven't we got amazing science to help you? But we've got amazing science to keep you healthy, too. But it's quite obvious and simple. But they don't want to talk about that. It's good nutrition. It's good sleep. It's lack of stress. It's exercise. It's all the less cool things that they can't bottle and sell you. So we, we just focus on this end of the scale. When you get sick, you can do this. And we go rushing for the pill to fix me. Oh, my God. It's like, well, you know, maybe if you hadn't let the, the car go to rot, you wouldn't be needing a mechanic at that stage, you know. So so what you're saying is right. It's like keeping healthy is just so important. But it's so easy, particularly with the, with pets, because they're not going into the shops and buying crap food with their pocket money, you know. So they are only eating the stuff we give them. So we can do so much better by making some simple choices and it doesn't have to cost any more money than what you're feeding at the moment. In fact, you can probably feed considerably better food for a hell of a lot cheaper than you're feeding at the moment, making your own treats. It, it's so Especially easy. if you're uh, feeding a prescription diet. Yes. Yeah, so that, that veterinary group over there, how long have they been doing that? Uh, Wiley Vets, will be hard to say, more than maybe 15 years. I think that, wow. that health plan has been going at least 10 years that I've known about. So I'm going to add five years onto that, maybe 10 or 15 years. And how successful have they been with that? No idea. No idea about the business. I heard that it's very difficult to, uh, like, it's not exactly, if it was going to be the most profitable thing, every single veterinary group will be doing it. But they're the only veterinary group that are all pro raw. So you would have to have, you'd have to change your ethos very difficult to turn around to all the vets in your clinic and say, right, from now on, all that dry food, don't recommend us. You don't have a job in here if you're rec- very difficult to shift your business that quickly. They started off on that foot. And so perhaps maybe that's why they're one of the few people doing it. But on the profit side of things, I don't know. I haven't, I'm not privy to that. Uh, it's really it because I'm sitting here going, wow, okay, I could get a license. I can open up that kind of clinic here in North Carolina and I'll never have to see anybody. It'll be awesome. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Perfect business model. You know, I, you know but it, it is really an 
interesting Isn't business this? model. I mean, yeah. okay, so we're gonna you're gonna have to give me some contact information because I'm gonna talk to you. Will. They would love to talk to you. And in fact, the guy uh, Richard, who's still there, Morkel has, has since left there about a year ago. He's on sabbatical back to uh, South Africa, where he's from. But uh, he's an unbelievable vet as well. Just to talk to him, it's one of these vets where you go, oh, my God, intimidating. Uh, just anyway. But they, they were saying that this is the way medicine used to be, that you used to pay the, the medicine man to keep you healthy. And if you got sick, it'd be like, oh, buddy, this isn't really working, so I'm not going to pay you anymore. It's like going back to the same mechanic when you're sick. People will go back to the same vet for that shot of you know Cytopoint every month for your dog who's got a bit of itch. And it's like, so you're telling me you've been going to the same vet for two years and your dog is still itchy and you're still taking the meds. It's like, well, we've tried everything. I said, your vet has tried everything. Try the next vet down the road. Give somebody <laughs> else a shot, you know? But we're so just like, oh, we'll stick with this doctor and then I'll go to my grave with him. Why? Yeah, you know, it would be really interesting if we could find a dermatology group who yeah. actually would recommend the appropriate diet but you know what? They wouldn't make any money because they wouldn't be able to sell Apoquel and Cytopoint and prescription yeah. diets and allergy testing. I mean, it, it would all disappear. Yeah. And yeah. it's just, you know, I got so many clients who came in with their animals who had been seeing the same dermatologist for three to five years, the same veterinarian for three to five years, or they had been to 10 different veterinarians, but they keep getting the same treatment. It, you know, because it's just the same, the, the traditional medicine for itchy, allergy, whatever, gunky ears, it's the same, no matter which practice you go to, it's the traditional medicine, this is how much they have in their bag of tricks. Yeah. Yeah. And if it's, it's the definition of insanity, you keep repeating yeah, the same thing, expecting a different result. And then you know, I would say to people like, okay, well, you, you, your dog's been getting Cytopoint shots every six weeks for three years. Your dog's been on Apoquel for five yeah. years and your dog's skin is the biggest mess I've ever seen. At what point yeah. do plan? you actually say, yeah. hmm, maybe yeah. we're, we're repeating the same insanity and it's yeah. not working. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's so hard. It's so hard for the pet owner because they, they don't know and they're not going to question the vet. And even when you do know, I wouldn't question the vet. You know, if I've got a couple of vets I, I trust. Now, I would question them over, I think, nutrition. But even my small understanding of skin and issues, that kind of stuff that you naturally pick up when you start doing this stuff all the time. Even then, I wouldn't question any of them. I'd say, OK, that's that's what we'll do. You know, and you walk out then going, actually, I don't know if I want to give augment. And like, what, what is actually wrong with my dog's gut? Where, how did he get this issue? And. Anyway, that's the that's the problem we have, and vet and and people are scared to kind of question the vet. But again, I don't blame the vets. I think they are advertised. They're they're sold a pup when they were young, and it's very hard for them to shake those messages. And there was a great study that there was a great uh, piece by Wall in Bloomberg, where the the high cost of modern pet of modern veterinary care, the high cost of modern veterinary care, and it's a shocker to read about this vet John Robb and what happened to him. And essentially, oh. oh my God. So this the, essentially um this group came in and they own the veterinary uh, the veterinary practice, they buy out veterinary practices. When shareholders start buying out your businesses, you know there's money to be made and it's not going to be ending well for the clients at the bottom of it. But uh, they buy out these these practices. And they, they put in the petware manual and they said, right, vets, from now on, this is the petware manual and you open it up. So when your dog comes in with a atopic dermatitis, we don't know why he's itchy. These are the things you must recommend. And there's a list of all these products and potions and things and therapies. And, te and it's like, bloody hell, there could be a flea bite. But you go down to all these lists and you've got, you've got to recommend this, this, this prescription food and everything else before you get to the nitty gritty of, let's try and fix this issue. No, 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 we don't. Want to. So that was a very... <laughs> that's a shocking shocking read and like it, it is tempting for people to blame the vets again but it's just like i think you just honestly believe they they haven't read the science they just believe they're shrouded by this by this science but actually they haven't read any of us and they get a little bit of a hump when you try to say well can i see the science you're talking about if you want to recommend a dry product for for kidney disease like can i see the study that you read that convinced you low protein is a good idea for dogs just starting off on their kidney disease show oh, yeah. me the study you know stale fats and dry food and all this other oh, you know anyway i'm getting annoyed yeah. <laughs> So easy to do. So easy to do. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it is a frustration. And uh, fortunately, I think we are starting to see little, um, little cracks 
in the in the foundation uh raw feeding is is growing um yeah. and i at one point a few years ago when i looked at statistics and i don't know now but um, at one point holistic veterinary medicine was the fastest growing part of veterinary medicine which was Great. awesome um, yeah. and the raw feeding category was growing more rapidly than any of the other categories yeah. um you know of course we have a long way to go but yeah. It, uh, but I think that these these big pharma and big pet food, um, you know, they see those kinds of statistics and they go, well, we have to ramp up our game. We yes. we have to, you know, do this great yeah. advertising and, and just say, no, we we did studies. We proved yeah. that this heart, this dry yeah. kibble heart diet is yeah. is going to make dogs live longer and shrink the size of their heart. And yeah. it's like, <laughs> yeah. It is. I know you. I, I think it's this last thing of a dying bee. No industry goes quietly. So it's like kind of like when we had the breast versus bottle debate, which ironically was the only time that the, um, the multinationals tried to make a complete food for humans and they failed. They couldn't do it. They couldn't replicate what Mother Nature has been doing for millions of years. You can't do it. It's impossible. They tried and it's pretty good. You know, if you need formula, fair enough. But Nestle fought tooth and nail to hang on to that product. And look what it did them. They became the most boycotted co uh, company in the world. And they're still at it in, in some of the poorer regions. That's all documented in the book as well. So uh, I'm not having to go at Nestle. I'm just saying that these industries don't let go of the message too easy. Initially, it's like, this is better than Mother Nature. We've done it. Uh, and then it turns out after a huge amount of effort from people and uh, NGOs and scientists and years and millions of money, uh, we, we eventually prove that actually, no, it's not quite as good as the breast. So, uh, so they say, oh, OK, fair enough. We'll back away. And they say, if you decide to follow on from breast milk, then this product is here. I believe dry food will go that way as well. But there's going to be a big battle before that. I think in the UK, it's at least 20 percent of pet owners are feeding um are feeding real food to their pets, raw food to their pets now. So uh, uh, people kind of like, you know, I don't really deal too much with the veterinary sector anymore. I used to beat my head off the veterinary wall and you're in the forums and oh, I'm losing my sleep over these things. But now I can see that actually focusing on the people, the people just want to listen. Half the clients that come to raw, they've got recurring skin and good conditions. And they want a solution. So they're easy. It's just like pop them out of that, talk to you in a month. Oh my God, you're amazing. It's like, not really. That's all I know. Uh, and, the other, and the other half just happened to be reading something and it makes sense to them but when you change the people the veterinary industry is a big problem now because they're already uh, stressed as you said and now their clients are coming in going no what you're saying about dry food is wrong or they're simply walking away from the practice right. uh, so i think jim morrison uh, said that uh, they've got the guns but we've got the numbers you can't you can't beat the industry. They've got a lot of money. They've got all the they've all the bells and whistles and stuff. We'll never produce enough science in, in the, the way they can do it. It'll never be enough. But what we do have is we've got the cash. We've got the numbers. We've got the pets. And when people start speaking with their feet and saying, you know what, I'm not actually supporting that message you're saying, try and get them on side with a nice, pleasant conversation. Don't try and, you know, get your message. Exactly. Through. It won't work. But if they're not on side, well, then you're paying the wrong person. I would say you need to go find a vet, get on Google, You'll find a natural vet pretty pretty uh, quickly, and then you support the vet that you do uh, that you do believe in, and you and so if their message is the one that you're funding, there's the message that that wins. So I think actually it will be a shift driven by the people. All revolutions are driven by the people. It's no other way because the top down don't want anything to change. Yeah. So we have to change it, and the way you do that is you vote with your feet. Stop giving your money to the same vet with the same issue. Uh, and don't give them any grief about it, but you can show them the way and say, I would like to stay with you, but these are my conditions. Stop slagging me off for feeding real food to my pet. You know, exactly. stop making me, you know. So uh, I think we're, it is changing and, and that's what the change will be, but that won't stop the industry throwing out some horrible little shots along the way because they don't want to let this industry go. Multi-billions they're making from this. Oh, yeah. Know? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. People say to me all the time, why don't you teach other veterinarians? Why don't you? Yeah. You know, I actually tried to get into a few veterinary schools and say, hey, can I at least talk to your holistic medicine club? Like, can I yeah. can I come in? I, you know, this is what I do. This is who I am. This, you know, I've written these books, blah, blah, blah. Nope. Nope. Yeah. They don't even want them exposed. It, 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 it's tragic. And I'm like, I, if I can't get in from on the ground level to teach better now i do have a lot of veterinarians who follow my my social media which is i think is kind of funny and i think it's great and i i love when they do um but we you're right we that's why we work so hard to educate the pet parent because yeah. the pet parent i mean 
I, I think that sometimes the pet parent loses sight of the fact that they're driving the car. Yeah. You know, that they really are the ones in charge. And we get people who are like, well, my, you know, my veterinarian says that what I'm doing is wrong. And so I second guessed what I was thinking. And you know yeah. what? Stick to your guns. Stick yeah. to your guns. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard. Like the vets do have all the training, but you know, the, the reports of how much nutritional training they're getting at the moment is pretty dire. I mean, some of the schools aren't teaching any summer. I think the average is 13 hours in Europe. Now that's unit hours they can be doing studying in the background. I understand that. But we do have a problem that when a heap of those hours are taught by a fast food clown, well, we've got big, big problems, you know, and uh, you could be sitting there over a weekend and learn more about raw feeding than a lot of conventional vets are doing because it's hard for them to even just face this subject for some reason. Cognitive dissonance is what it's called. Great book written on this called Black Box. It, well, yeah. it also could be that the AVMA right on the front page says, you know, no raw yeah. feeding. <laughs> yeah, they're not helping. Oh, they AVMA, aha, with... uh -huh, you know, it's like... Mm. Yeah. The AVMA uh, are, are a big problem. They came out with a statement saying uh, they took away fresh food from uh, service dogs in 2014, their statement on raw feeding. And you should have seen that statement for errors, Judy. It was just like you know, 10 or 15 lines of this bogus information. It leaps off the page when you're used to reading it. And they put a couple of studies. So it may, uh, has been shown to cause problems in humans, has been shown to cause contamination in humans. And I was like, oh, has been shown? That's interesting. I never knew that. And you go <laughs> find the studies and the studies don't say anything like that at all. I bring that up in the book. And but that is what took fresh food away. They use that, I imagine, when they were sacking Chris Lane. That's the sort of statements they say, well, look what the AVMA says about raw feeding. Mm. It doesn't matter that the statement is completely bogus, completely wrong. They take it down a year later, but it's done the damage. Uh, oh, yeah. Like, it, it's just, it, it, the AVMA are no friends of mine. My God, what has happened? So, uh, yeah. when We were traveling to Canada in our RV a few years ago uh, for me to speak at a holistic um, get-together. And... Uh, one of our, our, our 18 year old dog decided that he was stressed with the trip and he developed bloody vomiting and diarrhea. Okay. So here we are, you know, like in the hinterlands in our RV can't find okay. a vet. So I actually found a veteran. We just like, I said, pull off the highway. We got it. We got to do something. This dog's going to die. He's 18. He's dehydrated. Yeah. And when we pulled off, we, you know, things happen the way they're supposed to. There's a vet clinic right there. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> So we pulled in their parking lot. I go running inside and I'm like, look, I need some fluids. I need some anti-nausea yeah. meds. I need to <laughs> fix this dog yeah. right now. And this poor new graduate veterinarian, she'd been out of school for two weeks yeah. and the boss was away. Oh no. And so, you know, the receptionist, she's beside herself. She's like, I don't think I can just give you all that stuff. I said, I'll bring the dog in. Your veterinarian can do an exam. I don't care. I, yeah. I got to get some fluids in this dog. And so they were very nice and, and we did. And so I'm back there with my dog talking to the veterinarian, you know, basically pulling stuff off her shelf to treat my dog. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I'm like, do you have any B vitamins? You know, just, yeah. Yeah. And so she's, as she's talking to me, I mean, she's deer in the headlights. She doesn't have a clue. Oh, and she said, while you're here, could you look at some x-rays that I just took? Oh, no. Could you look at this dog? Oh, the poor kid. Oh, I know. So I felt so sorry for her, but she was just so in over her head. Yeah. But then when we finally got to our destination, the person who was hosting the seminar had called her veterinarian and said, look, when Dr. Morgan gets here, it's going to be about 6 p.m. I know that's close to your closing time, but would you, because she didn't know that we were going to get to find somebody along the way. Yeah. So, you know, would you stay open to see her dog? And they graciously said yes. So I'm like, well, even though the dog's already been seen, I'm going to go there because <laughs> yeah. they were nice enough yeah. to do this. So I'm yeah. like, all right, I'm going to pay for this all over again. Yeah. Walk in, huge signs in in the waiting room, in every exam room against raw feeding. The AVMA has cautioned, yeah. you know, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm like, okay, I'm not even going to say yeah. what this dog eats because yeah. I know where this is going to go. Yeah. <laughs> oh, your dog's got so yeah. mellow, we're all going to die. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's pooing diarrhea, but he's perfectly fine. He's nice. I'm not risk anybody. He's yeah. just a little stressed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're all a little stressed. And he was fine the next day. I mean, you know, he just needed some fluids. He, he was yeah. just stressed, you know, like yeah. we had been in the RV rattling around for a couple of days you know he was yeah just, yeah he looking did you, fine but look, and that, that little back. guy lived to be 19 so you know yeah, not an yeah. issue <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. And like even the longevity thing, people will hold up. At the moment, we've got there's a big push towards vegetarian, vegan pet food over here. And uh, oh, stop. It's so it's just <laughs> anyway, it's anyway. Um, but 
And they use the same old kind of nonsense science where like, you know, there is an interesting study by Axelson, the Scandinavians, where they found a couple of little genes are switched on, a bit more amylase production from the pancreas. And I thought, wow, isn't that interesting? Like, you know, Darwin would have given his eye teeth to see these tiny evolutionary steps that are happening in dogs from living beside farmers for 6,000 years. Isn't that amazing? Uh, so what dry pet food does is that all oh, that's why we feed 50, 60 percent high dose carbohydrates to 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 dogs. You know, it's just so ridiculous. But this this push for vegetarian vegan food at the moment is is really idiotic. And uh, it really, really bothers me. And the statements that are coming out at the moment about it are just uh, they need to be put to shame. So I'm I'm nearly at the point of kind of collecting people's names and saying, like, you actually. So the, we've got a, a vet here in Ireland. Who I know he's not listening. And he's a big, big, you know, he's got his own dry food company and he's, he really does not like raw feeding, doesn't like fresh food at all. And the latest statement from him in the in the leading British newspaper, it was this article uh, saying that um, cats are cats are stone cold killers, but you can feed dogs vegan diets. That was the title of the article. So it's like he's gone. So he said, OK, cats need to eat meat, you know, but dogs, you can feed dogs vegan diets. Now, there's no studies to, of any value, of any merit whatsoever to support that statement. But plenty of the vet industry would get behind that first before they'd get behind fresh feeding to pets. I mean, can you imagine that they, they're like, that's proper idiocy? That's like there is nothing to suggest that dogs should be fed vegan diets. Nothing. And you'll get behind that and you won't get behind fresh food. I mean, I what is wrong? See, that was one of my rules in my clinic. If you wanted to make your cat or dog a vegan, I'm not your vet. Yeah, definitely. Uh, that's where, that was my line in the sand because I saw too many cats die of heart failure and, you know, detached retinas yeah. and everything else. Yeah. Uh, you know, unable to walk because their muscles don't work. I'm like, yeah. yeah, no, I can't be yeah. part of this. Not, yeah. not going to be part yeah. of it. And they say that, well, listen, we've got some long lived dogs that were vegetarian, vegan. It's like, I don't doubt it. You know, I've got a 94 year old chain smoking, obese granny. What does that tell you? About <laughs> smoking and being fat. I said, look at very little. These tiny examples and little anecdotes of some blue healer out in the back of Victorian Australia. I don't care. I want to see I want to see 15 people playing a sport or, you know, um, 15 smokers against 15 non-smokers. And then right. you, see, you see what happens in the second half, you know. So, like, it's, it, these are the studies that we don't have. And so what you have is all this nonsense that people are talking about and, and getting so head up. And now we're in this, bi this very polarized culture, as you said at the very start, bringing it back to the very start. We're so polarized. It's yes or no, good or bad. This is correct. This is wrong. And people just going mad on at each other online i don't have any more time for it online i don't do any more stuff online i don't talk to people online anymore i'm fine because yep. really it's it's bad. not it's not just the pet it's everything in life everything. right now yeah, it's yeah. either you're on this side or this side there is yeah. no middle ground There's no gray no no in no subject whatsoever and this is like <laughs> it's, it's exhausting you know and it i just want to I just want to sit at home and write stuff and research and go, Ooh, this is interesting. And my tail's wagging. And I put it up to the nerds that follow my page uh, and they all go, that's great. And that's it. That's my life. You know, try to make a living out of it. And, and then, you know, that's it. That's all I want at the moment. Oh but man. Uh, I swear we're, we're, up, we're coming up on an hour, but I, I could talk to you, I think, until <laughs> next week. Um, <laughs> this. this is just great. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to do this again. Um, right. Tell people where to find you. Because, I mean, okay. you, just, I, you have so much great information. Like, first of all, I need to know where <laughs> to go find all this stuff. Besides your book, uh, which I'm going to go order in about two minutes. <laughs> I'm going to quote you on that. The uh, Yeah, my website is dogsfirst, D-O-G-S-F-I-R-S-T dot I-E. So that's my, that's my baby. It's my mothership. And I, uh, up until very recently, I would have been writing constant articles for that. And now I'm being pulled in behind the scenes to do different bits and pieces. But my book is called Feeding Dogs. It's available on Amazon, particularly to uh, American following i think i've got one or two stockists in the us i'm so sorry i can't remember their names but uh amazon is uh print print on demand for that book so that's that's who's been shifting the book in the states for me so that's where you find me on facebook you'll find me on dogs first on facebook where i do general day-to-day -day chats and stuff but uh yeah so most of my living now is is, is this book and um yeah. so everyone thank you so much for watching today connor thank you so much for Love agreeing to do this to. even yeah. even with all our technical difficulties yeah we got there eventually yes absolutely and i'm just post COVID as well so here on i was delighted with my lack of brain fog so there you go <laughs> there you Back go off the ropes oh man all right everyone have a wonderful day um 
Tomorrow I'm on the road driving to Florida to go to Global Pets, so I don't know if I will do Facebook Live on the road or if Gwen will be doing it from the warehouse. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> we'll try to figure out something. Like Connor, ninja. enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you so That's much. Loads of Thanks I so much. Appreciate it. See ya.